Hi, and welcome to the first session of the Building a Type Checker class, where we talk about type systems, inference, and implement a static type checker for a full programming language uh, similar to Python or JavaScript. And similar to other classes in the From Scratch series, uh, this class is also very practical. Right, we will have just few amount of theory uh, related to types. Uh, however, most of the videos will be actual practical exercises. Right, so here's the agenda. And the first thing we need to say, there is an optional prerequisite for this class. And this is the essentials of interpretation class, uh, where we build an interpreter for a programming language, right, at very high level, at the AST level. And unless you're familiar with concepts such as uh, abstract syntax trees, uh, how eval works, what is uh, closure, scope chain, identifier resolution, etc., it is highly recommended to take this course. Since in the current class, in the built-in type checker, uh, we will be working with pretty much similar language, right? It's called EVA, as we will see shortly. Uh, and we will implement a type checker module, um, which can sit on top of the interpreter. So with this being said, let's get started. In the previous classes, we mentioned that we distinguish languages on interpreted and compiled. And rather, these are not languages, but the implementations. Uh, and let's quickly recall the AST interpreter and see how we got to the evaluation. So here's the typical pipeline for the parsing. Right, we start with the source code, let's say the simplest program, print hello. And the first module which meets our program is known as the tokenizer, that is the uh, scanner which defines the lexical analysis. And the purpose of the tokenizer is to group individual characters into stream of tokens. Right, As you can see, a token has a type and some value associated with this type. In this case, we have two tokens, identifier with the value print and the string with the value hello. Uh, again, the purpose is just more convenient handling instead of uh, single characters. And then the stream of tokens is passed uh, to the next module, which is called parser, which already defines the syntactic analysis. What is the difference? Well, the parser actually validates uh, whether our program is syntactically valid. Right, if the tokenizer could extract some list of tokens, uh, which could go just in arbitrary order, then the parser actually validates that these tokens should go in specific order. And as the result of the parsing, we got our abstract syntax tree, or the AST for short. Now, this representation is already something we can fit uh, further either to the code generator and produce some next intermediate representation, usually bytecode um, or the native machine code, uh, or we can pass directly to the interpreter. Now, to understand how to get from the source code to the AST, you may also consider two classes. One of them is building a parser from scratch, right? fully practical class. Uh, when we take uh, a language very similar to JavaScript and parse it into AST. Or you may even take the essentials of parsing, uh, more of a theoretical class, and we work with the parser generator tool, uh, also built in a full parser, uh, but automated parser. So now when we have the AST, as we said, we can just pass it directly to interpreter and obtain the result. And this is exactly what we did in the essentials of interpretation class. We got fully working language at this level. So what are the types? Uh, where actually the types fit into this picture? And in this class, we'll be talking about the static type checker. That is, the type checker module works at static time. Uh, to recall and reiterate, the static time is something before runtime, right? We haven't started executing the program yet, right? We work purely with the source text, right? With the AST representation, but it's still the source text. There is no actual uh, values, right? So runtime is not even involved at this stage. And as the result, we get uh, some transformed, or as we call type checked AST. Uh, right after this module, we can be sure that all the values, or at least most of the values, have passed the sanity check, the type checking. And we can guarantee, for example, that in operation uh, 1 plus 2, 1 and 2 are actual numbers, but not uh, booleans or strings. And then we can pass the same uh, AST down to interpreter and obtain the result. Uh, we said the same AST, but it's actually not the same AST it already has some type information, uh, which the interpreter or the code generator can uh, leverage to generate more efficient bytecode, uh, to do faster evaluation, etc. And this is the picture of the interpreter with an optional type checker. And we call it optional because it's really the type checker can be implemented as the extra module for even existed programming language. Um, as an example, TypeScript to JavaScript, right? It was uh, some type information added on top of that, or flow type checker for the JavaScript. Very similar situation. And from this perspective, we separate type checkers on static and dynamic. Uh, as we said, the static type checker works with the source text, right? Only with the AST, uh, and it doesn't have access to the runtime. And so many uh, dynamic programming languages have dynamic type checker, 
What this means, they just check some of the arguments for functions or some uh, operations at runtime right before doing that operation. Uh, what the problem with that? Well, uh, of course, it's performance. Since you have to do extra work at runtime, instead of running useful code, you run some uh, infrastructure code, validating types, etc. So it's always good to have an extra static type checker. Now, we should also say a language which uh, leverages the static type checker may optimize data storage for runtime. Right? We say may optimize, but it's not required. An example might be C++, which works with raw values, right? They represent it as is, without any extra information, uh, which might also be a problem. For example, in C or C++, um, if we reinterpret some bit pattern, we cannot say whether it's a number or um, an address, like a memory address, a pointer. And if you have the dynamic language, uh, similar as we did in uh, EVA virtual machine implementation, a value is usually represented as a structure containing the type tag plus the actual value. And in that case, you may easily um, differentiate numbers from addresses. So once again, the static type checker doesn't mean you always have some uh, optimized data storage, but you may. Uh, when talking about types, we also talk about strong typing and weak typing. And this is something, uh, there is no common agreement uh, what specifically that means. Usually this means some stricter rules and some weaker rules on type semantics. Uh, usually it usually relates it's to converting some type implicitly uh, at runtime. And for example, in JavaScript, it's completely normal to do uh, string 1 plus number 10 and get some string as the result, uh, which is the error in C++. Uh, another example might be casting some subtypes to some different shapes right, reinterpretation of the bit pattern again in C++, right, so when implement a type checker, we usually want to have more stricter rules. And it should be a balance. Sometimes uh, to enforce more stricter rules, you have to reduce some of the code convenience, right, do more type annotations, etc. Now, with this respect, we also differentiate type systems on the sound and unsound. Usually that means that runtime gets some guarantees from the type checker that everything will be okay when the runtime will be executing. And on practice, this usually relates to type safety and memory safety. Let's take a look at this example in C. So we define a, an integer x and then the string character array. But then we can define the pointer z uh, and just do some operation x plus y. Now, how can we add integer to a character array? What's going on? But that's completely legal for C++, right? This is just a pointer operation. And z pointer now points to the uh, 10 characters beyond the Y, pretty much accessing the garbage data, and uh, which potentially will result to a segmentation fault here, uh, which means uh, C is neither type safe nor memory safe, even though still have a static type checker. And we should also say that the type systems are covered by the type theory. And in type theory, uh, we do have concept of the type judgment. What this means, let's take a look. Uh, so here we have this symbol uh, turnstile, uh, which literally we can read as it follows that, or it proves that. So the type system, this type judgment, proves that the type of the true literal, right, the true value is Boolean. Right, with the same success, um, the type system proves that type of the number of any number is the number. So these are very basic type judgments, uh, pretty much what we can rely on and which is known uh, before we can reason about more complex type judgments. Now for variables, we use concept of so-called type environment. Uh, which is denoted by the Greek letter gamma. And what is the type, for example, of a variable x? Uh, well, we don't know. We have to look in the environment. Uh, in this case, the type environment gamma proves that the type of x is some type t, right? It might be a number, it might be boolean, depending on the initial value which was assigned to t. And usually in static type checking, the variable holds the type, right? Not the value as in dynamic or untyped systems when the value holds the type tag, but um, a variable is assigned a type in the type environment. And we will talk about concept of environments uh, further in this class. However, what is the type of a complex expression? Let's say we have to infer the type of the expression um, E1 plus E2, right? The type environment gamma proves that the type of the E1 plus E2 is what? Well, we don't know what it is unless we go inside of E1 and E2 Right, which might be arbitrary complex expressions, and follow the same exact procedure, following uh, deeper and deeper down until we reach the very basic types. So in the type judgment, in the type system, it's uh, written like this. Right, If anything on top of the line is true, this means anything below the line is also true. 
right? So if the uh, type of the E1 is number and the type of E2 is number, then we can precisely say that the type of E1 plus E2 is number as well. And again, why do we need to go down to the expression? Uh, well, because for example, plus operator can be overloaded. Uh, in this case, this type judgment will also be correct. If the types of the E1 and E2 are strings, then the E1 plus E2 is the string. And if you look at this notation, uh, this is actually the tree. Let's just show again. To get the type of the complex expression, we have to go and see what the sub-expressions, uh, which pretty much brings us to the form of tree, uh, or it's better to show it like this as an actual tree, uh, which brings us to the concept of the abstract syntax tree. What this means, we can implement a static type checker at the AST level, at the abstract syntax tree level. And this is exactly the topic of the whole hour class. And now in type systems, we also talk about type checking and type inference. Let's see the difference. Uh, the simplest example might be variable declaration. Um, for example, in C++, we have to define the type together with the uh, variable. Right? Sometimes you may use outer type, but let's say we explicitly define the type and we cannot assign incorrect value to a variable which was defined with certain type. However, if we take, uh, let's say, JavaScript with some optional type checker, we can pretty much infer the type, right? We say that the type of X should be a number because uh, its initializer had the type number. The same for the string. However, once we annotate a variable declaration with a type, this is where this inference will be followed by type checking. And in this class, we'll be combining type inference and type checking, right? We will not be requiring specific types of variables because we can normally infer the type, uh, but we will hold types for the uh, function signatures, right? For parameters and return values. Another example of inference might be working with some generic functions. Uh, let's say we have a generic function, add, which parameterizes some type k, and we can call this function passing the specific type. Right? These are generic functions in Java or template functions in C++, but we can normally infer that type through the parameters, right? through the parameter values. And in first case, we pretty much have the explicit polymorphism. In the second case, we have inferred types or implicit polymorphism. Now, some languages may even implement full type inference. Um, examples ML, uh, might be Erlang and others. Uh, so, in fact, we may even omit type annotations for everything, and still the type checker can understand all the types. Now, we will not be using this approach in this class, uh, since we agreed we need to have some type annotations for function um, signatures um, by multiple reasons. First of all, it improves the doc documentation, right? When people see the function signature, they pretty much understand what's going on without looking into the function body. So our purpose is not to take untyped programs, uh, but to take a typed program and provide some inference and some type checking, unified approach, which is usually used in practice for most of the languages today. However, if you're interested in the full type inference without annotating types, uh, there is so-called algorithm, Kindler-Milner algorithm, or HM. And just to briefly show you, it works with the concept of the constraints. So initially, we don't know what the types uh, of the parameters x and y and what is the type of the function add, right? We don't know whether it's a function at all. Uh, so we initialize our environment with some type variables, let's say t1, t2, and t3. We don't know the types yet. And we say we have to apply a certain set of constraints to infer actual types. And then we go deeper. At some point, we have to reach some functions at runtime which should have type signature, right? So when we say about full type inference, this is not true. There should be already built-in operators which have specific types. In this case, that's the plus operator, uh, which should accept two numbers and return a number, from which we update the constraints that the t1 must be a number and t2 should be a number. And that's the return value. That is the type t3 should be a function which accepts two numbers and return a number. And exactly correct from which we can say that x is number, y is number, and add is a function. Uh, again, in our class, we'll be using the approach on the left. We pretty much will be specifying the types for parameters and return values, but we'll allow omitting the types for the variables. So this is the introduction for the theory, and with this being said, please meet Eva, or meet again. This is the programming language we work in this class, and since we focus on the AST type checker, we use S expression format. That is the parenthesized notation, where the first symbol is the type tag. For example, the first expression is addition, because it's type tag is plus. Uh, this is the assignment, type tag set. And we also may have some complex expressions, for example, if, uh, which has sub-expressions for testing, consequent, and alternate part. 
Now, another example is the function declaration. As you can see, we use the def keyword from Python. And in this case, it's untype expression. And here's how the function will look in our class, right? We'll have to provide type information. And with this, each parameter is becoming a pair consisting of the parameter name and its type, and also will be providing the return type. Now we're also going to support uh, type declarations, aliases, and uh, generic programming. Let's take a look. You know, for example, we have the function add, which uh, add numbers, but you also may reuse the same function for string concatenation. In this case, you have to redefine pretty much everything, just changing the types. Uh, the solution might be the union type, when you define a new type, which is either number or a string, right? And that's something we also are going to support. Or you may even define a generic function, right? Parameterized by the parameter k, which is the type. We don't know what type it is until the function call, and, but this is something we also support. Uh, for functional programming, we're going to support uh, lambda functions, so-called anonymous function expressions, and also immediately invoked lambda expression where we can define a lambda and directly apply it to some arguments. Uh, again, typed version of this expression would look like this. Okay, so with this being said, let's jump to the implementation right away in the today's lecture. So I'm creating the directory for our project called EVA TC, and TC stands for type checker. Okay, and let's create a source evatc.js. And we should make a note about implementation. Sometimes people think that to implement a type checker, you certainly need to use some typed language, say as OCaml or at least TypeScript. So something is very related to uh, typing itself. But actually, no. As we will see in this class, you may use plain JavaScript even without types to implement a static type checker. Right? Again, the purpose of this implementation is not to be using a specific language, uh, but to show the most concise uh, implementation, not distracting from the type theory itself. So this code should be portable to any language of your choice, right? To Rust, uh, OCaml, etc. And we represent the type checker as a class, where the main API method is the TC, that is type check. Now, as we said, we're going to use combined approach. Now, this function TC actually infers the type of expression. And while it infers the type of an expression, it does the type checking. And today, let's start from the very basic expression from numbers. So if we determine that the expression is number, we return the number as its type. Again, the TC function should return the type of the expression, right? Sometimes this function is called type of, for example, in JavaScript. Uh, and in addition, we'll be doing some type checking here. And in today's lecture, we'll just use string representation, just number, and later we'll introduce uh, an actual type system. Now, how do we know that the expression is uh, a number? Well, we implement it in JavaScript, right? So the actual type of of the expression in the implementation language, in the underlying language, should be a number. Right? In that case, we return that the EVA type for this expression is also a number. And that should be pretty good enough for the first case. Let's start from testing. I'm creating tests and main uh, runner, tests run JS. Uh, I'm creating an instance of the type checker. And let's do the first assertion. The type of the number one should be a number. Uh, to validate, let's put some message, all assertions passed. Okay, let's execute, and it works. So congratulations, we have the first type checker for the first value, and that is for numbers. Uh, let's test some other number, 42, and it also works. And from this point, we can go forward and support, uh, let's say, strings. Uh, we're going to represent strings uh, in double quotes, so 42 string should have the type string. Let's try executing. And our type checker correctly says unknown type string. So we have to implement it. And this is your first assignment. Please go ahead and implement the strings. Uh, and we'll follow up with the implementation in the next lecture. Okay, so that's it for today. This is the introduction lecture and uh, what we'll be studying and building. Uh, again, in the next lecture, we'll start talking about uh, strings and the actual type system uh, and going forward to functions, classes, etc. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks and see you in the class.